Good evening and welcome to the British Library. I'm Bea Rolat of the Cultural Events Team and I'm very excited to introduce a transatlantic conversation with a certain gleam of wickedness. We have the legendary Joyce Carol Oates and she's in conversation with Kirsty Logan. Kirsty is joining us from beautiful Glasgow. Um, her latest book is a horror collection Things We Say in the Dark. And this follows on from lots of award-winning other books, including The Gloaming, The Grace Keepers, A Portable Shelter, and The Rental Heart and Other Fairy Tales. Finally, Kirsty is on record as saying, basically, my life is all books, all the time. Quite right too. And you can, of course, buy tonight's books here on the platform, as well as submit your questions and feedback. We love to hear from you. Meanwhile, I'm handing you over to tonight's chair, Kirsty. Hello and welcome to this British Library event. I'm Kirsty Logan and it is my great pleasure to welcome Joyce Carol Oates this evening. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates has won many, many prizes, including the National Book Award and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She's the author of over 70 books, including novels, short stories, poetry, plays, and nonfiction. And most recently, she has published a collection of novellas called Cardiff by the Sea, which we'll be discussing this evening. Uh, the way the event is gonna work this evening is we will discuss each of the four novellas individually, and then there'll be time at the end for audience questions. And you can ask your questions just below the live feed. So please do join me in welcoming the wonderful Joyce Carol Oates. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Yes. Very, very happy to be speaking to you. Um, so Joyce, I believe you're going to introduce us to the first novella in the book with a reading. Yes, I'll say a few words about the, the book. There are several novellas and they, they all deal with young women. In one case, the, the girl is about 12 years old, but mostly they're, they're young women in their 20s who are confronted by something totally unexpected that has to do with working out their own destiny. The first novella is called Cardiff by the Sea. And when I was rereading it just this morning, I was so struck by how so much of it seems relevant to the pandemic and the isolation and quarantine that some of us have been living through. I mean, I personally have been living all alone in my house, four miles outside Princeton, in a, in a wooded area and there's a creek and a lake and I'm all alone, you know, and through the winter with the wind howling, <laughs> it sort of sounds like a Gothic situation. When I wrote the novella, I would think I was actually in Berkeley in California where it was sunny, but our lives are so unpredictable. We, we wind up in places later that are relevant to what we have written. So it's, it's as if the world catches up with us. So as I said, the first of the novellas is called Cardiff by the Sea. And the situation is this young woman who does live alone. She's an art historian and her, her telephone rings. She's all alone. She is not married. She's an adopted child. She was an adopted child and she one is if she should answer the phone. She sees the caller ID, does not recognize it. And she's sort of contemplating, does she want to answer the phone or not? So I'll just read this, these passages. Phone rings unexpectedly. Not her cell phone, which Claire would probably have answered without a second thought, but the other phone, the landline, which rarely rings. She has seconds in which to decide, should she lift the receiver? Seeing that the caller ID is not one she recognizes and calculating it's likely just to be a robot call. Yet this rain lashed April morning, out of curiosity or loneliness or heedlessness, she lifts the receiver. Yes, hello. One of the shocks of Clara's life. For it seems that a stranger has called her, introducing himself as an attorney with a law firm in Cardiff, Maine informing her that she's the beneficiary of an individual of whom she has never heard, Maud Donegal of Cardiff, Maine, your grandmother. Excuse me, who? 
Ma Donegal, your father's mother, she passed away at the age of 87. Oh, she's not sure what she's hearing, thinking it must be a, a prank. Her first instinct is to laugh. But I don't have a grandmother with that name. I don't, I don't know anyone with that name. Did you say Douglas? Donegal. A pause and the voice at the other end of the line continues disembodied and matter of fact as a voice in a dream. But Donegal is your birth name. Didn't you know? So that's the beginning of this novella. A young woman who feels that she does know herself. She knows her adopted parents and she's quite content with living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, gets this phone call and she learns that her, her birth the grandmother has just died and left her a bequest. So that's the beginning of an adventure. It is, and it's such a classic beginning to a story. You know, this mysterious phone call comes out of nowhere. How's the person going to react? And I would love to talk about expectations and subverting expectations because you know you mentioned the gothic and it does hit so many of the gothic tropes you know we have the family mystery we have this spooky old house we have the young woman who's out of her depth and she's trying to uncover this mystery um also i won't go too much into details but i love the the part where she's not really sure if she's being poisoned or not so you don't really know what's real and what's not real but at the same time, Claire, the protagonist, she's very active. You know, we might think of the gothic heroine as being perhaps a bit helpless or a kind of fainting flower. And she's not like that at all. She's very active. So how did, how did you approach that, telling this classic tale, but still keeping it fresh and original? Well, you know, we, we, we use words like, like gothic, adjectives like gothic as a kind of shorthand. But I'm, I'm not sure if it's always helpful because... The last year for many of us, many of us have been alone. And when you're in solitude, you do much more intensive thinking, I believe, than when we're out in the world. Because the uh, environment, this room in which I am right now, uh, the environment is so much more finite and stable. Ordinarily, we're out and our, our neurological apparatus is taking in all sorts of new sites. We're driving our car. I would take the train in New York City. I've been teaching at NYU. All the, the actions of our being in the world came to a halt for, for many of us in the United States in quarantine. And it's so unnatural that I think other parts of our imagination start coming alive. So I'm not so sure if Gothic is even the word, it's more like a, a realistic apprehension like to be realistically and reasonably afraid of the virus is something that would keep a person alive. You know, it's a survival instinct. It's not really a gothic instinct to, to feel that one, one's life is in peril. It's, it's almost just a realistic uh, apprehension of the world now. So I thought that was very interesting to revisit something I'd written maybe a, a year ago or more, maybe about two years ago and see how now what might have been considered a surreal experience, now it feels much more realistic. When the telephone rings at a quiet, empty house and you're making your way toward that telephone, and by the way, I rarely get telephone calls from friends and mostly solicitations. All my friends write to me by email or text message. So when the phone rings in this house, I usually have to walk a distance to get it. And I'm thinking, should I pick that up? Who would that be? And that's the uh, kind of existentially dramatic beginning of, of this novella. Mm, I'd love to, to pick up on what you're saying about this, this idea of an existential drama. And also, of course, you know, you mentioned the pandemic and how it's affecting us all. And I can't tell you how much I identify with what you were saying. I felt lately um, very hungry, but it's almost like my eyes are hungry. Um, I get so starved of new things to look at, you know? Um, yeah, I just feel like I have hungry vision in some way. But I wondered how you thought, you know, not that you can see the future, but how you think perhaps this time might affect writers. Do you think there will be a great forgetting and we, will we all just want to never think or write about it again? Or do you think writers will talk about it in their work? 
Well, Kirsty, that is such a good question. It's really an excellent question. I think very provocative and probing. Now, from what I know, <clears throat> after the 1918 flu ep uh, epidemic, there was something like a great forgetting. And uh, there, were, there were very few writers who wrote about it. Catherine Ann Porter has a novella called Pale Horse, Pale Rider. And that has much to do with the, with the influenza epidemic. Uh, Catherine Ann Porter is a wonderful writer who now I think is little known, even in the United States. But she lived through the pandemic of, of that time and she almost died. And she wrote a beautiful novella about it, but uh, almost nobody else wrote about it. And I think a few years later, people just were, you know, they were not talking about it. The roaring twenties came along in America and everybody was, you know, dancing and celebrating and spending money and, and sort of maybe reacting against all that death. Maybe that will, maybe that will happen again. Or maybe we are in the brink of a world in which there will be one virus replacing another and that will be kind of a systematic and overlapping perils that we have to deal with as a consequence of global warming. As I understand it, maybe microorganisms don't die, they don't get frozen as much when the, when the soil doesn't freeze to a certain uh, depth, they don't die off or they're not, you know, they're not frozen in the winter. So there is more te teeming life, viruses and other sorts of uh, perils for, for Homo sapiens, which was not the case before. So we may be moving into a new era. I think we're all like explorers. Some of us are, I think, ima imaginatively stirred to write maybe a little more surreal work but other people, some other people feel stymied in silence. They feel depressed or they, they don't know where, who their readers are anymore. Now, because I live in the United States, I've also come through four years of exceedingly toxic political climate with, with a good deal of, uh, of division and anxiety. So. Many Americans actually are like battered spouses, you know, and hit, sort of hit on the head um, in a political and cultural sense. And that's been four years of the Trump administration. Now that's over with. So I think we're kind of in a, a honeymoon period now where we're, we're sort of giddy with relief, but the long-term effects of that maybe will come back. Absolutely. And if you don't mind me asking, how have, have you found this current situation, whether it's politically or, or to do with the pandemic, has it affected your work? You know, it's often said that you're incredibly prolific. So the work that you've been producing lately, do you feel it's changed? Well, like most novelists, I've been, I, I work on something for a long time. So I was working on a novel at the time of the pandemic and I just continued with that. It may be suffused with a sense of peril and a, a sort of exaggerated caution, I'm not sure. But we also live through the same sort of thing. By we, I mean writers in the New York City vicinity after 9-11. So the, the immediate after effect of 9-11 for people in the vicinity of New York City, which is where I am, was um, numb, numbness and shock and in inability to work. Our students were in a state of <laughs> catatonia. I mean, pe people actually didn't know what to say to one another. It seemed so stunning. I was not in New York City, but of course I knew many people who were, and I, I'm only an hour away from New York City. So that was overwhelming also. Whereas the virus and the pandemic have been much more a phenomenon of, of duration. It started for me in March, on March 11th, 2020. That was the beginning of the lockdown in Princeton. In New Jersey, we were told to go to our houses and stay in our houses, that there was this contagion, we could spread it to one another. And there was immediately such a sense of, of wonderment and anxiety so those early days, the early weeks of 2020 uh, lockdown were very different from the way we are now. 
is I took notes on it and I wrote about it actually for the TLS. I wrote a little piece for the TLS. And so that those early weeks are, were different. Uh, we were all much more insomniac and anxious, sort of physically anxious. Many people could not sit still. We would get up and walk around and then sit down again and go into another room or look out the window, <laughs> you know, or write emails to, to our friends. And we stopped seeing anybody. We stopped teaching. I, I didn't, my class just stopped and then I was teaching by Zoom. So that was, I think, psychologically very fraught. And I don't have anything in, in the novellas specifically about that but each of my characters finds herself in, in these existential situations where it's like the walls are closing in. And so it's almost as if I was anticipating something like that when I was writing these. In the last, the last novella in the collection called The Surviving Child, a woman is actually in a house that she sort of thinks is haunted. I mean, the reader thinks she's probably psychologically vulnerable in imagining things. And that's how we all, many of us got to feel that way about our own houses. Mm. Well, in that case, yeah, let's mix it up a little bit. Um, let's move on to talking about The Surviving Child, which, as you say, is the last. We will speak, of course, about all, all the novellas in, in the book. Um, but, yeah, let's speak about The Surviving Child. Actually, that was my favourite um, of the novellas. I think they're all wonderful, but that was certainly my favourite. So, um, Joyce, would you be able to just introduce that to us and perhaps read? Yes, thank you. The Surviving Child... Uh, this, the surviving child is one of my very favorite stories of my own also. And I, wouldn't, I would not want to say that it is based on Sylvia Plath. It really, it is not based on the biographical or the historical Sylvia Plath. But what, what excited me and sort of thrilled and, and terrified me as a theme, I remember years ago, hearing that the, the um, mistress of Ted Hughes had committed suicide in the way that Sylvia Plath had, in, in literally in the same way. And she had also taken her, ch her child or maybe, a, maybe an infant with her. So the uh, first Sylvia Plath committed suicide, but she did not take any children with her. She was quite solicitous that her children were protected. She was living in London during a cold spell and she put, turned on the gas oven, which I think at that time in, in English society was a way that women sometimes committed suicide because it was so easy and domestic. And so Sylvia Plath did that. Ted Hughes had, had left her and was living with a woman whose last name was Wiesel, As Asia Wiesel. I may not be pronouncing that name correctly. He felt tremendous guilt for having abandoned his wife and he was with this other woman, but the other woman also felt tremendous guilt because Sylvia Plath had committed suicide and then she herself did commit suicide a couple of years later. And I thought about that as we all did. I think it's a sort of fe feminist mythology or something like a fairy tale, this curse, like the curse on the second wife or a curse on Ted Hughes. And so my, my novella, as I say, it's not really about her. It's about a young woman who marries a man who had been married to a poet who had committed suicide. And she had committed suicide in this house, in the garage of the house with her little girl, little daughter. And a little boy had been with them, but he escapes. So this, this poet, woman poet did murder her child and tried to murder another one. But the little boy escaped from the garage with a carbon monoxide is sort of filling up and, and killing the, the mother and the daughter. He escapes and so he's a, he is a surviving child. And he is a child who is very be a beautiful wounded little boy. And the second wife of the man who had married the poet the second wife really feels a, a love and sympathy for him. She wants to be his stepmother. She wants to win up his trust. And the novella is really about the second wife 
who comes into this world, this house, a beautiful house uh, in, on the seashore in, in the United States, a, a beautiful, sort of a beautiful old house, but there's a, an attic room where the woman poet had written her work and then the garage where she committed suicide. So the woman's living in a house that in a sense is haunted. I think if any of us moved into a house where somebody had committed suicide, we would feel haunted in some way. I mean, maybe not literally in a, in a ghostly way, but in a psychological way. So, I mean, I'll just read the little paragraph here. The surviving child he's called, not to his face, of course. The younger, other younger child died with the mother three years before. Murder, suicide it had been. More precisely, filicide, suicide. The first glimpse she has of the surviving child is shocking to her. A beautiful face, pale and lightly freckled, darkly luminous eyes, a prematurely adult manner, solemn, sorrowful, wary, and watchful. As sharp as a sliver of glass piercing her heart comes the thought, I will love him. I will save him. I am the one. So the novella is really about her mission to save the boy. And as I was reading it, it does sound a little bit like the uh, idea of the governess in, in James's The Turn of the Screw. You know, I'm going to save these children. But I hadn't thought of it at the time I wrote this. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, there's the Plath illusion, the Henry James illusion. And then, um, of course, there's the, the Rebecca illusion as well, because she's the the second wife and she's very much overshadowed by by the first wife and what struck me about this one was I think all the novellas are hauntings in a way they're they're all about women and girls who are haunted somehow and I but I feel this is the most um haunted house story you know the protagonist as you said is haunted by by many things by the first wife by this child who is this sort of beautiful wraith who he sort of never is quite where you think he is and you look around and he's in a different place. And But she's also very much haunted by the house. And I wondered about your thoughts about haunted houses, whether you think they're a particularly female or even feminist type of a haunting. Well, again, this is an extremely interesting question. The house is some sort of a trope, I think, just generally speaking for maybe the, the psyche or it could be the female body. And when we're, when we're dream, many of us dream about houses, I think, I mean, I don't know about you, but I often dream I'm going to some house, which is somehow familiar, like my childhood house, but unfamiliar, like it, it isn't really my childhood house. I seem to be going through some rooms or in some, along some corridor or something. It's emblematic of our search for our, our own inner being, I think. And the idea of the being a castle, as in the old traditional Gothic, that may have something to do with there being an exalted ru ruling class, like fate. Um, we, we don't have that same sort of inherited uh, ominous feeling in America. It, it, it's much more of an egalitarian society. So we could have the Gothic experience with, with a different kind of architecture. For many people, I mean, I'm just guessing, but for say Stephen King, for instance, the haunted house would just be somebody's childhood house. It could be suburban. It could be an ordinary house. And when I think of the haunted house of my life, it was my, the old farmhouse where I lived with my parents and brother and, and my grandparents. We lived in a um, extended family, it's called today, but, that, but many people lived with their grandparents. Or, I mean, it wasn't a time when I was first, when I was born, it was more of a time when I think families lived together uh, multi-generations rather than just a nuclear family. So I might think of that old farmhouse and if I fall asleep and have a, a, a disturbing dream, I'm probably back in my old room. And this is decades ago, you know. But it is, but it's not a gothic house that would be frightening if you looked at it, you know, in a photograph. It just looks like 
a fairly ordinary house. It was built in 1888. I always remember that. That was on the, the uh, foundation of the house, 1888. I always stayed with me as such a long ago time. It just seemed like it could, it could be medieval. Mm, that's, it's funny that, isn't it, how everybody has house dreams. I always have ones where I find an extra room in my house. I don't yes. really know what that means. I do too. I have that all the time. And I found out in conversation, somebody else has the same dream. There's some part of the house that you haven't even known was there. And I, I have this kind of repetitive dream where it's the, it's the same sort of situation. And I know where that room is. Like it's, a, it, it's in a basement. I think well, I'm going to go and check out that <laughs> that room, but, but there's never any resolution. Like I never find out anything and then I'll just have the dream again. Maybe, yeah, I'm sure there's some kind of deep symbolic meaning of what, what the room represents or means. Um, but I'm very aware that I, I don't want to miss either of the other two novellas because I would love to hear more about them. So do you want to choose? I'm happy um, I can choose which one for you to introduce to us or you okay. can choose whichever you like. Um, let, let's go for the second one. Let's go for Meow Dao, and you can um, introduce and hopefully. Oh, Meow Dao. Well, yeah. which um, is great when you were talking about <laughs> this sense of peril and being trapped. I think that leads us perfectly. Well, this is a fancy name for a very special cat. And I'm so sorry that my special cat, who was the model for this, this gothic kitty in the She's not in the room. I do have another cat on the floor here. I have two cats. But the Meow Dao is a feral cat. There was in the story, uh, a family breaks up. A father leaves his wife. He will become involved and remarried with a much younger woman. But the, but the girl who is 13, she's 12, uh, she doesn't know why her father has left home. And she has two younger brothers. And None of them understands. I don't think anyone ever understands why a father leaves the family. And so the little girl is very, very hurt. She's very wounded. She thinks of it as like a, a, a bat flying at her face is the image. When, when her, excuse me, here's my kitty. Oh. So we're talking about you, Kitty. This is Zanchi. And we're talking about this very big feral cat who is in the knot. She's in the story. And I hate, I'm sorry to say that she turns into a vicious murderer. I was gonna say, are you confessing something about your cat's secret life now? I'm giving away too much of the story. <laughs> but the, the young girl whose father has left her becomes very vulnerable to boys at school. They're just, she's getting to be 12 years old or 13 and she's self-conscious about her body and she is a shy girl and the boys are just very rude. And then her mother starts going out with a, with a man who also seems kind of, kind of uh, threatening to her. So this is all, I think some, it's a very realistic experience for girls about 12 or 13 almost overnight, they attract the unwanted attention of, of older men. Let's say they're walking alone along a sidewalk and you suddenly see people looking at you who didn't look at you like a year before. And it's just very unnerving. At the same time, there's a feral a colony of feral cats like right next door to where this girl lives. I live in a wooded area and there were feral cats around here. And I used to feed some feral cats on my porch, just two, just two of them. So I'm very sympathetic with animals that are homeless. And um, I give, I mean, I participate in, you know, sort of taking care of them, some, some uh, rescue shelters in the area. So it's a subject that I, that I care about personally. And in the novella, the, the feral colony is, uh, is devastated. Somebody calls animal control and they just get rid of them and probably all the cats are just euthanized, except one. There's a kitten and she's a very fluffy, beautiful cat who grows very quickly, becomes a big cat. And it, 
and this is like the spirit alter ego of the girl. This cat, she she can cuddle and sleep and you know and love and embrace this cat. She has lost her father and she's she's anxious about the future in her own life. So the cat becomes like a spirit consort. And I, I don't want to give away too much of the novella, but I think it does have a, a happy end, a, a positive resolved ending, a good, a good ending. I, tr I try to end my, all my writing on a plausible note that is positive. I mean, I can't guarantee a happy ending because that's not, that's not realistic, but I can try to work out a way that there's a certain integrity remaining and somebody has come through an experience. So the girl is probably 13 years old by the end of the novella and she has asserted herself rather than being a victim. She's, she's, uh, she's sort of lashed out against her adversaries because of the cat. The cat gives her strength. Mm -hmm. but this cat has sort of run away, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm glad that we got to see the cat anyway. Um, <laughs> What, what I found really fascinating about the, the use of, of the cat in this story is that the cat is domestic, but also a predator. And again, without giving too much away, also in this novella and actually in the others, the, the one that we think perhaps is the victim or the one who's going to be victimized actually ends up having a surprising strength. And I wondered if that was a subject that you had consciously decided to explore in the book. Yes, that's a theme that's very that's very uh, important to me. The the empowerment of girls and women. I think partly we can take that empowerment as a, as a, a sort of exemplary way of responding. That rather than seeing ourselves as victims, we see ourselves as people to whom something has happened that's unjust, and we want justice. And I don't think the word victim needs even to be in the vocabulary. Once you think of yourself as a victim, then that seems like being like an invalid, you know, and people feel sorry for you, or it doesn't seem healthy to me. I would rather think of some in, injustice and you simply want justice. And that's very logical. That's sensible, that, that's legal in a way. There's a kind of moral legality. If you have been harmed, you want justice. So the girls and the women in my writing very often are struggling. I wrote a novel called My Life is a Rat recently, and that did come out also in, in, the, in the UK. And, the, and this is a girl who has to extricate herself from her own family because they are very stifling and, they, and there's some problem with the family. She has to detach herself from her family, but it's at great emotional cost but she does. She's probably about 21 or 20 at the end of the novel. She's managed to, to make that break. I think that the, uh, the great torment, it's really emotionally a torment for many women and girls is to assert themselves as individuals if somebody who loves them wants them to be different. In other words, you may have to make a break with someone who doesn't accept you, even though you love them so much. It could be your own family. Like you, you love them so much, but it will break you to conform to their idea of you. And I, I find that a very heartrending subject. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I, lo I love this idea of, yeah, not, not a victim, but something someone who something's happened to and seeking justice. And I, I think those ideas um, bring us really nicely onto the, the last novella in the book, this sense of family and not quite being who other people want you to be. Um, so the last novella is Phantom Wise 1972. So would you be able to introduce that to us, please, Joyce? Yes, yeah, so well, Fan Phantom Wise makes allusions to Alice in Wonderland. And some of you probably Oh, you might remember this poem by, by Lewis Carroll. He talks about Alice. Of course, Alice in Wonderland, Alice was a real girl. And Lewis Carroll was, was writing about her. He was obviously 
infatuated with her as an emblem of innocence. Alice Lydell, she's, we, we can all sort of envision what she looks like because her picture is very, very, uh, very well known. And my, my young woman's name, Alice, A-L-Y-C-E, and she is um, an undergraduate student. She has left home also, and she becomes involved with one of her professors. And then she later, she's rejected by him. And then she becomes involved in a very daughterly way with an older professor. He's, he's old enough to be her grandfather. Uh, she doesn't love him and she, there's, it's not a sexual relationship. It's more like father daughter or like Lewis Carroll with Alice Lydell. And this novella begins with, um, it's really a flash forward. When we read it, we're not sure if it's flashback or present tense, but it's actually fast forward. And it's about this long, it's very short, italicized. Out of the steep snowy ravine, clutching at rocks, her hands bloodied, and all the while snow falling, temperature dropping to zero degrees Fahrenheit. How still the soft falling snow amid rocks, the yearning, the temptation to lie down and sleep. He'd wanted her to die. He wanted to kill her with his hands, but she has escaped him. He will not follow her. She vows he will not find her ever again. So this is the young woman and she's being followed by somebody. I won't say who it is, but it is, it's one of the people whom I just mentioned, but somebody who wants to kill her, but she seems to be escaping from him, sort of going through the snow. Yeah, I was hoping you weren't gonna give away the ending there because my heart was in my mouth the whole time that I was reading those final pages. Yeah, it was... Um incredibly tense and, and, and beautifully written. Um, I'm, yeah, we're gonna chat a little bit about Phantom Wise 1972. And just a reminder to everyone that if you have questions for Joyce, you can put them in the box just below the live feed um, and they'll come through and I will um, put those questions to Joyce as well. So first of all, I would love to, um, to dig into this a little bit because um, as we were saying, all the stories are hauntings in some way, but what I absolutely loved in this one is that, um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say because it's revealed very early on that um, Alice, the protagonist, is pregnant and she's unexpectedly pregnant. She doesn't particularly want to be pregnant. And I'm just gonna quote from, from this novella. Haunting to her now, the dark menstrual blood that refused to appear, like a shadow that when you glance up, startled, has vanished, has not been there at all. And I just absolutely loved that. I've never seen that before, you know, haunted by, your own period or the lack of period that you want to come. I just thought that was so fascinating. And it made me wonder, do you think, are we all haunted by something? Is every person in this world haunted by something? Well, in this particular case, it's, it's 1972. So in the United States, abortions were really not very um, possible. They were illegal. Now, of course, women and girls did have abortions before 1972, but in the, in the later 1970s, there were abortion clinics and it was much more uh, a possibility. You know, it would still be traumatic and it was nothing that was treated lightly. So at the time of this, like 1972, it almost feels like a death sentence, you know? If you did actually have an abortion, it might be like a slaughter. It could be, you know, the doctor wouldn't even be a real doctor, who knows? Some parts of the United States are reverting back to that. The state of Missouri just, just I mean, I think that yesterday <laughs> passed laws that have banned abortion in the whole state. Now that doesn't mean that women and girls are not gonna get abort abortions, they will, but they won't be legal and they will they be very dangerous. So they have to leave. So this, I, I deliberately set the novella at that time when to be pregnant as an undergraduate and it was sort of an accidental thing that happened. She really was almost like a rape victim. Um, we would call it date rape, which I think is such an ugly term. I hate to use it, but she was forced to endure a sexual experience 
that she didn't really she didn't really want, but she didn't want to cause any any trouble either. I mean, she liked the man. She she did like him. She might have felt she was falling in love with him. But what happened was to her almost like an accident. You know, it wasn't exactly a violent rape, but it, it was not really consensual. Anyway, she is pregnant. So that's such a physical and existentially real situation. But she's an undergraduate, it's 1972. And uh, part of the story is when we do find someone who loves us, that person would love us if we were pregnant. I mean, if you find someone who loves you, that person will love you no matter what situation, like if you become ill with some illness or break your leg or, or whatever, you're still loved. And so there is that possibility of, an, of a, uh, almost like a, a selfless love that we can aspire to and hope for in contrast to this more brutal, narrow-minded, almost sadistic love or sexual desire that this other man felt for her. I hope that hasn't sounded confusing, but it's like there are two men, two, two possibilities of love with a man. One is this brutal uh, sort of self-serving love of one man, but then the other man, uh, it's more like a genuine, a genuine love of her and respect for her. So he would be very happy if she had the baby, and, but the other one wants an abortion. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was wondering as well, in terms of, of haunting, or even maybe feeling preyed on or followed by something, I'm even thinking about feral cats following somebody around. Do you think writers in particular feel haunted? Or do you think writers feel there are certain subjects? Um, just because I, I saw a lot of um, overlaps, and it was almost like the novellas were in conversation. And also overlaps with your other books and it was like all your books are in conversation with one another and I wondered if there are certain things that you're haunted by or things that follow you around maybe like feral cats well all of us work out of our memory and whether we're writers or, or creative artists of any kind or just normal human beings we think a lot about the past if there's something unresolved and mysterious in our past we tend to think a lot about it so writers and poets especially a certain kind of lyric poet will write about the past. Sometimes it's commemorative, like much of Irish poetry is commemorative about Ireland, sort of looking back at uh, 19th century and early 20th century Ireland in a nostalgic and romantic way. Much of American literature is looking back at a, a, an earlier time before in so much industry People think that America took a sharp turn in a tragic direction around about 1963 when John Kennedy was assassinated. I think looking at a, at looking at a long distance, we see an, an act so, so traumatic culturally when a president who is beloved and sort of young and handsome, he was assassinated sort of in plain view. It's like a fantastically horrific act of un, something unnatural, like a ritual, like a tragic ritual in, in plain air. It was thought that sort of America had a nervous breakdown. And the 1960s are fraught with assassinations. I've written about some of these situations, of course, the assassination of Martin Luther King as Malcolm X, Robert Kennedy, and other, there are many assassination attempts that didn't actually take, take place. But it, everything just sort of fell apart in, in a way in the 1960s, 1970s, about the end of the Vietnam War, but very belatedly, it was just one going on and on and the generations became very, um, very angry at one another and dissociated. And those divisions between like pro-Vietnam War people and anti, they're still with us today and like the pro-Trump people, the anti-Trump people, um, the divisions in America between what we call red states and blue states and people who believe in freedom of choice for women of abortion and those who are against abortion and outlaw it. 
those divisions in the United States really came, started to become very clear in the 1960s and extremely clear in the last five, six years in this country. We're hoping that there might be some, uh, a little more unity now. So a lot of my writing takes place during, during that time. There's the division between a one way of life and another way of life. I tend to write about young women and girls who are more of an, of an educated or literary class, not necessarily wealthy, but just people who care about books, people who love, who love poetry or love music or art, people who are more traditional in that sense. And they may have some relationship with traditional religion, but they're not they're not evangelicals. It's more like a, a more of a spiritual religion. My own feeling is that religion can be very positive for people if it doesn't, if it's not punitive. I think the unfortunate element of religion is that it's so much of it is punitive, wanting to punish. And this doesn't seem to me inevitable that religion has to have that punishing side to it, but that that really happens historically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's interesting that you mentioned about, you know, the red or the blue states or the pro or anti various things. And it has always seemed to me as, as an outsider looking at the US, there's a lot of very binary thinking. Um, you know, you have to be this or that, and there's really not much in the middle. And I've often wondered whether that comes from it being essentially a two-party political system or whether the two-party political system comes from America being a sort of binary thinking place. I, I don't know what the answer is there, but what do you think? Well, historically, there were, there were more political parties in the beginning. In a very, in a very beginning, you know, in the, 19, in the 1770s, in the very beginning, there was the pro-English lo loyalist Americans, and then those who became the rebels. I mean, eventually they became they became the uh, the citizens of the United States, you know. But in the very beginning, you had people who, maybe within one family, were pro King George, or anti the King, or pro England, and or anti England. So it was a matter of it was taking sides, but I think sometimes within one family. And many ordinary people didn't have a great deal of thought about it. You know, they, they, you know, farmers or peasants living out in the country, I don't think they cared as much as the, the leaders of the colonies. Uh, people like Char uh, Thomas Jefferson and of course, George Washington and Tom Paine and other leaders were, were intellectuals. And Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and and a number of men signed it, but he, he mainly wrote it. And it's, it's such a, a, it's like a legal document. He's setting forth these terms of why it is necessary to break away from England because of the tyranny. And there had been many concessions made to England. The colonists were naturally, uh, they were naturally patriotic for England. They themselves were born in England. You know, so it becomes a matter of having been mistreated. And Jefferson gives all these reasons. I think they're like, I don't know how many, there could be 50, you know, 50 reasons that he gives. And then the Boston massacre with British soldiers firing on unarmed um, colonists sort of pushes us over that. So once you get beyond that, I think there's much more uh, multiplicity of um, political factions in the United States, where in the beginning there were just two sides, then later on it's, it's more confusing. In the North, you had uh, the abolitionist movement during the Civil War, but, but, but that was not unified. There were many people in the North who didn't care whether there were slaves. They weren't fighting, they didn't, they didn't really care. There were riots in the North at the time of the Civil War, of men who did not want to fight. They didn't care if the South seceded. They had no interest. They really didn't care. And, and so the abolitionist movement, we tend to think was very powerful, but it, it wasn't really. It, it gathered momentum with the Civil War 
and uh, has a kind of romantic tone to it, I think now. But at the time, neighbors were divided against one another. So it's kind of a long answer to your question about binary. So I think that what the United States is, and that same thing is true of, of England and other countries, but we are so vast, the continent so wide that it's more of a problem. We are a nation of regions. There's a New England and there's a, there's North, Northwestern, and there's a Southwestern, there's a South, there's a Midwest, there's the Mid-South, and all, all these parts of the United States are pretty different. The, especially in the past, New England was quite distinctive. And all these regions are not, not unified, really. Same is true in Canada, where you have a, a, the provinces are sort of stretched east to west along the border. They have much more re relationship with the United States south of the border than they do with, with one another. Mm -hmm. And then we are also a nation where urban development uh, very density of population in places like Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York City and Atlanta and Dallas and Houston. The, ci the cities are where the universities are, Cambridge, Mass, and Boston. You have universities and colleges and a diverse population of Asian Americans, Indian Americans, Every kind, of, every kind of ethnic identity in these population density areas. But then you have rural, rural America, which is sparsely populated. States like North and South Dakota, almost nobody lives there except in the cities. And so you have a rural constituency that, that doesn't really feel comfortable with diversity. And some of these people far out in the country they have never met a Jew. They've never met a Chinese person. They've never met an Indian American or a Pakistani. They've never met any of these people, but they, they think that they hate them because they've been watching Fox News. You know? So politically, it's a matter of conservative people living remotely from the urban areas where you will find extremely uh, developed technology, young people studying computer science who are just, who are brilliant. Some of them are my students studying molecular biology and computer science and they're writers. Those are such brilliant young people, but they have very little really to do with, with elderly people living in uh, Northern Montana who are very uh, suspicious of anything that's not American. And they're all, it's kind of white supremacy and that's the binary there is between the old idea of a white Christian nation and a, a completely new youth oriented, educated, diverse population, America. So that's, that's what we have now. The Trump people were or are the white supremacists who have a lot of strength really. And then the the Biden people are just this big group of all kinds of people, including many, many women, women of color. All, you know, that's the binary between those two. Absolutely. I feel like we've opened up this huge can of worms and I would love to just talk to you about this all day, but I'm very aware we've got some excellent audience questions. So I'm going to come to them and uh, get through as many as I can. Um, I thought this was a great question to start with because I noticed that Netflix is going to be airing an, adapt an adaptation of your book Blonde quite soon. And Amy Neal asks, what are your thoughts on the cinematic adaptations of your work? I can talk about any number of my, my um, works that were adapted. But Blonde has, has not come out yet. I'm not sure when it's coming out. Sometime in 2021, I think. Andrew Dominic, who's a very gifted and sort of idiosyncratic and special director, wrote the screenplay. He adapted it from my novel, Blonde. And he wanted to make a movie that is by a man, of course, since he's a man. But he wanted to make it a woman's movie a from the perspective of a woman who happens to be Marilyn Monroe. And 
that sounded so interesting to me. I've seen it and I found it very, very, very disturbing. It's, it's quite brilliant. It's not exactly, it's not really the Marilyn Monroe that people think they know. And my novel wasn't really about her either. But when I, I told Andrew who sent it to me so I could see it, I saw the rough cut. And as I told him, you know, I couldn't actually see it all the way through. I found it so upsetting. I had to stop watching it and kind of come back a couple hours later and then watch it again. Then I watched it all, all the way through in the continuum. And I said, you know, Andrew, it almost seems to have the feel and the music confirms that of a horror, a horror film. And he said, yes, I, that's what I was trying for. In other words, the experience of being a woman in Marilyn Monroe's world in the 1950s was like a horror film. And I found it almost too disturbing. So how that will be greeted by people, I'm not sure. Marilyn Monroe was a very complex figure. And when I wrote my novel Blonde, I did a lot of research into her acting. I saw all her movies that I could in chronological order. And I could really see her growing as an actor. She's extremely underrated and misunderstood. But I do think that many people just think she's like the young woman in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes or some like it hot. They just think that she's this ditzy blonde, very beautiful, but childlike. Now the real Marilyn Monroe was not like that at all. <laughs> and if anyone was a victim, if we use the word victim, I'm, I'm afraid she actually well, was a victim. And she never, I don't think she really, um, I don't think she escaped that. I think she tried to, but ultimately she, she, she seems to have succumbed to that. So it has, a, it has a tragic ending, but it's very well done. I think this concept of uh, a fictionalized version of Marilyn Monroe that plays like a horror sounds like an absolute dream. I'm very, very excited to, to see it. Actually, that leads us on very nicely to uh, this question, which is from Jonathan Matheson. It's a two-part question. Um, the first part is, do you think that the horror suspense short story novella or novel is a particularly American genre? I think of Edgar Allan Poe, Flannery O'Connor, yourself and Stephen King. Um, and I like also the second part of this question, which is you use brackets a great deal. What is your reason? Well, there are really two, two issues there. I'll talk about the brackets. Well, I use par parenthetical thinking a good deal because I find that is so psychologically true. Like I, I may be thinking a thought or even talking in, in a kind of straightforward way, but I, but I have a little bit of a, like a side thought or a mitigating or qualifying thought about it, you know? And so putting that in is a way of, of signaling to the reader this little ellipses. Like it's a beautiful, a beautiful, bright day. You could say a beautiful, bright, ominous day. You know, like it is just beautiful and bright, but something about it is ominous. So you put the ominous in parenthesis because it's not exactly explicit. It's more like something you're thinking, but you don't want to tell it. You don't want to tell anybody. So sometimes I do that. And I, I found that is a way of, of making the, the style a little more true to the flow of our thinking. Because we do sometimes say one thing, but we really mean another. And sometimes we're not noticing something, but really we are noticing it. You know, it's like pretending not, not to notice it. And then the other question, no, I would say really uh, probably the opposite. Edgar Allan Poe was greatly influenced by the German Gothicists and, and writers of the early 19th century. And we know that the, the English ghost stories and the Irish ghost stories are, are very famous. I mean, 
that seems to be obvious, you know, Stephen King is someone who, who would have maybe learned a lot from, from 19th century writers and from, from H.P. Lovecraft, who, who also looked back. In other words, the, um, the Americans were really looking back to another, another uh, either to Europe or, or England for their own in, influence. Washington Irving, he wrote Rip Van Winkle. I think he was, I think he almost appropriated or even st he stole the whole story of Rip Van Winkle from some German legend. And some of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's stories I think are pretty much appropriated also. So it's just kind of, an, it's interesting because it may seem that Poe is a, is a wild original but he actually isn't in a tradition. Mm. So I remember, do, do you know that quote, uh, that originality is all about the obscurity of your sources? <laughs> I wonder if that's true. <laughs> yeah, that may be true. I think sometimes we're, we're really surprised to learn that somebody just appropriated a whole lot of material from somewhere else because we didn't, we didn't know it, you know, we just, I'm not going to say any names, but there have been some quite famous novels in, Amer in the United States that, that really had a lot of critical acclaim, but they really appropriated a lot of material from somebody else and just sort of put it in there. And that's like the best part of the novel that that's happened a number of, it's odd, it's, it's, it's strange. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I could talk to you all night, Joyce, but unbelievably, we are out of time. Um, but I just wanted to end on this. Uh, it's actually a comment rather than a question, which I know people usually dread, but I think this is a particularly good one to end on. And it comes from Natalie Baker, and I'll read it in full. Um, Natalie says, only to say that where are you going, where have you been, helped me find my voice as a writer. I've mostly read Joyce's earlier works and will always return to We Were the Mulvaneys to feel inspired again and again and again. I will always hold a big place in my heart for Marianne. It's been a great pleasure hearing Joyce and seeing her cat. Um, thank you for hosting such a great event. It's made my lockdown. And I have to say it's made mine as well. So thank you very much. Um, all that's left for me to say um, is please do click books, which is just at the top of the page there to buy the excellent Cardiff by the Sea. And as you can see, I have the UK cover here, which has a very beautiful photo on it. Um, you could also get my book, Things We Say in the Dark, if you want to. Um, so thank you so much to the British Library. Thank you to B. Rowlett for organizing the event. And most of all, thank you so much Joyce Carol Oates, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and we didn't talk about your book, and I have read, <laughs> I read the stories, and I, I thought they were really, really unnerving and uncanny. Oh, thank you. Creepy, creepy as we say, really, but, it, but elegant, yes. Thank you, I'm yes. blushing now, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, we didn't talk about it, we ran out of time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.